I'm uh, Nick Sava. I'm an orthopaedic foot and ankle surgeon. I work here uh, at Fortius in London and I also work in Dorset at, in Dorchester. I specialise in all aspects of foot and ankle surgery including trauma, uh, sports injuries, arthritis and toe deformities. Okay, so I'm going to talk about chronic ankle instability. Um, the ankle is a very, very different joint to the shoulder because it's more constrained. And so true instability isn't quite such a clear-cut entity as it, in, as it is in the shoulder. And to me, um, it's a large uh, spectrum. You see very few patients with ankle instability that haven't had a significant... I'm going to concentrate on lateral instability, by the way. Um, you, don't, you see very few patients that have, had, that have uh, ankle instability that haven't had a significant ankle injury at some point. So the classic is an ankle sprain. So an inversion or supination injury, so classically the foot is plantar flexed and inverted or supinated, um, causing pain, swelling and an inability to walk. And they are phenomenally common. So what gets stretched? Well, we all think about, we've got a pointer. We all think about um, the ATFL, sorry there, and the uh, CFL as being stretched. But of course, everything gets stretched. The skin gets stretched. So in some patients with a very severe sprain, you see actually fracture blisters. So those horrible big blood filled things. Um, something that I didn't really realize until I started seeing ankle patients regularly was how commonly uh, you get a neuropraxia of the superficial perineal nerve. That gets stretched severely. And these patients complain of horrible dysesthesia and neuropathic pain at night, which keeps them awake and makes them very miserable and can complicate your treatment of the, of the problem. Of course, the perineal tendons coming around the, lap, the posterior part of the fibula here can be torn or can actually snap out of place and dislocate or sublux. And the, and the inferior extensor retinaculum likewise. And that's before you consider the bones. Now we have a very nice set of rules that help us before we have an x-ray or dis to decide whether we should get an x-ray. Uh, these say basically that if you don't have any tenderness on the posterior part of the lateral malleolus where nothing attaches or the posterior part of the medial malleolus where nothing attaches then you don't really need an x-ray because it's unlikely to be fractured. However, in most ankle sprains you get tenderness anteriorly because that's where the important stabilising ligaments are. So you don't just get fractures of the malleoli, you can actually get an intraarticular fracture. So Burton Harty, many, many years ago, postulated the mechanism at which you can get an osteochondral fracture, so a chip off the talus as the talus tilts within the mortise. And this can go on and cause an osteochondral defect that doesn't heal and feelings of instability and pain. These sort of fractures, avulsion fractures, cause untold confusion. Um, this is a, a nice example of um, ATFL, which is pulled off the neck of the talus. Often a patient will suddenly um, been told they've sprained their ankle and will see the report of the x-ray that's been taken that says fracture and will come back to you very, very anxious, and you guys, I'm sure, very anxious that they've got a fracture that's been missed. But of course, it's essentially a significant sprain. So how do we treat these? Well, you guys know better than me, but I, I stick to the sort of phases of healing and how I think about treating them. So in the inflammatory phase, when all of the right cells are turning up, so the fibroblasts, the angioblasts, the chondrocytes are, are turning up, it's about damage control. So keeping the ankle still, so you limit the amount of pain and swelling. And that goes on for up to a week, 10 days. And during that time, it's probably good to immobilize the patients. And there's now some good evidence that actually putting them in plaster for this time isn't such a bad thing. During the proliferative phase, when all of the new fibrous tissue is being laid down and the new synovium and the new tendon, um, it's very important that the ankle is just put through a functional range and that's where you guys do your proprioceptive exercise and prevent a further injury because we know that maturing collagen that's stretched beyond its natural limit tends to form um, in an abnormal weaker way to sort of type 3 collagen rather than type 1. And then during the remodelling phase which goes on up to, what would you say, a year, maybe 18 months, you again want to prevent further injury. And so some sort of functional uh, bracing is very effective so in, during that time, like a, a stirrup type brace. From my point of view, I like to see the patients at a, delay, a delayed period. So ideally at about five days to a week because that's the most sensitive time to pick up um, a, a, an ATFL or a CFL rupture. The question of what to do with athletes and whether there is any role for anything more interventional such as surgery in an acute sprain, I'll come to you later. So what is chronic ankle instability? Well, to me, it's a, it's a spectrum, all the way from um, a, a significant ankle that just gives way painlessly right through to painful instability. Most people come in with painful giving way or locking or clicking or so on. 
this, that was a nice example of somebody who has quite a significant instability of their ankle when they go up on their toes, but interestingly that was due to a perineal tendon injury many years ago. I have this concept of mechanical instability where just the ligaments are, are failing through to functional instability which is a combination of failure of proprioception or perhaps it's pain inhibition because of a loose body or locking um, and so you need to remember that it's not just the lateral ligaments that cause instability. So how does it present? Very rarely we see patients that come in with an ankle that gives way without pain. I don't see these very often. More often I see recurrent ankle sprains which are painful but get less painful with time. Most people come in giving an odd history of, you sort of have to tease it out of them, of um, pain and unreliability and they use unusual words to describe it. And lots of people talk about things that they avoid, rough ground, pebble beaches, because of uh, pain and instability. So what are the risk factors? Well, we know, we know that um, you, most patients have had a previous ankle injury. There's no association with the severity of that injury. There's good evidence that there's no association with a number of injuries. But what we do know from a very nice study of an awful lot of basketball players in the United States is that lack of treatment at the primary significant injury increases your chances of going on to have another injury. Ankles are more unstable in people with generalised joint hypermobility and the inherited collagen disorders such as Ehlers-Danlos and Marfan's. Uh, but these are, in a general orthopaedic practice, very rare. So the problems must be multifactorial. So there are anatomical variations that predispose you to an inversion injury. So a varus heel or part of a cavo varus foot um, gives you an abnormal rotational alignment of the talus. Um, you tend to have a larger um, talar dome. The lateral malleolus is posterior. There's lots of other pathologies that can predispose you to this and you mustn't miss them if you possibly can. Having a tight gastroc, so a positive silver ski old test. Anterior impingement is another driver because you don't want to dorsiflex your foot, so you tend to walk on the outside of your foot. Tarsal coalitions are another unusual, rare cause of ankle instability. This is a, an interesting example of this is the talus and this is the os calcis. And can you see the subtalar joint is, looks very, very abnormal. And if you look at the talar navicular joint, you can see there are significant osteophytes in a young patient because of abno abnormal movements at that joint because the, the hind foot is so stiff. And interestingly, the syndesmosis is also getting stressed regularly by regular inversion uh, injuries because the hind foot moves so abnormally. So the most important thing for me is the history. I really spend a lot of time working out exactly what I think is wrong. And I, at the end of the, our time, I will ask the patient, what is your main problem? Is it giving way or is it pain? And most people can't tell you, but it is, they are somewhere on that line. It's very important to find out when the first event was, to my mind, uh, because the longer it ago it was, I think the less chance you have of sorting it out with some form of therapy. What treatment have they had? Have they had the full gamut of non-operative treatment? Does the, the, does the ankle give way? How often? How, how imp, imp, imposing on their lifestyle? Is it? Uh, and so on. Examining the ankle. I'm looking for the alignment, so have they got a cavo varus foot? Where's the tenderness? Do they walk normally? Does their hind foot move, nor move normally? The anterior draw test is very, um, very helpful, but only tells you about the ATFL. Inversion injury, uh, inversion varus tilt test is useful, and this is a nice example of a sulca sign under the tip of the fibula in somebody with a deficient calcaneofibular ligament. And I do a variety of that proprioceptive Romberg test where I get people to stand on one leg, bend their knee and shut their eyes. And people that have functional instability really struggle to keep their knees still. And of course we do the Baton score. Radiological assessment is extremely important. This is a plain radiograph of an ankle and I don't know if you can all see but there is a classic x-ray finding of an osteochondral fracture. But you can imagine as the tail is tilted that corner was just knocked on the tibial plafond. They are very, very often missed. Stress views don't play any part in my um, treatment of chronic ankle instability, but MRI scan and ultrasounds very much do. This is an MRI scan of a normal ankle. So this is the, um, this is the talus and this is the fibula. And this is a normal, thick anterior talofibular ligament. And here you can see lots of fluid, white is lots of fluid, um, on, this, uh, on this sequence, and you can see there's nothing there, just scar tissue and another, another view at another level just to prove the point.
you can see all of the ligaments in the MRI, but it's harder to see the posterior ligaments and it's harder to see the calcaneofibular ligament. So before we even talk about surgery, I make sure the patients have had full rehabilitation. So what's the role of arthroscopy in ankle instability? Well, it depends where you are on that spectrum from uh, mechanical instability through to functional instability. If you're suffering from uh, functional instability due to soft tissue impingement, it has a significant role. An osteochondral lesion, syndesmosis injury, ossicles where um, the ligaments have been pulled off, loose bodies uh, or perineal tendon disorders, then that can be the sole cause of your instability feelings. And so it's very important that you consider ankle arthroscopy. These are the arthroscopic pictures of a patient that's got um, anterior impingement. So just to orientate you, there's the talus, and this is the tibia, and the fibula would be behind here. What happens when you get a, a chip of the cartilage within an ankle is you get lots of osteoprogenitor cells, which do strange things to the synovium and cause, cause them to hypertrophy. And so you get, often get thickened fronds of synovium, which can get pinched between the two bones, or neoligaments in abnormal positions that can get pinched. And these can be very painful and very easily dealt with arthroscopically. Syndesmosis, syndesmotic instability, so this is a nice example. You can see the, the, the gap between the two bones is too wide there, is another good reason for, for ankle instability and is, is very easily dealt with arthroscopically. This MRI scan shows abnormal fluid between the two bones. There's the tibia and there's the fibula. Occasionally, when uh, you have a significant inversion injury, a piece of bone is pulled off the tip of the fibula with either the ATFL or the PTFL or a bit of both attached. And the evidence is that if the lump is more than about a centimetre, you should probably take it down and fix it. Um, and if it's less than a centimetre, you should probably just remove it and then repair the ligaments. And in this patient, so we removed it, repaired the ligaments, and at the same sitting, had to deal with a syn an unstable syndesmosis with um, some clever sort of tightrope things. So what are the indications for ligament surgery? Well, I find it very difficult because I really don't enjoy performing ligament surgery after I've done an arthroscopy. When you put a telescope into a joint, lots and lots of fluid extravasates into the soft tissues, and it makes it very difficult to identify normal anatomy. And of course, the anatomy is often abnormal anyway. And so we try to limit our surgery to the exact problem, but it's often very difficult to work out exactly what to do, uh, exactly what's causing the problem. And so I tend to avoid doing both if I possibly can, but if you have mechanical instability and there's no other obvious pathology, then you have to do both at the same sitting. Fortunately, the, uh, there isn't so much con uh, controversy about whether you repair or reconstruct the ligaments. So we've been repairing the ligaments um, on the lateral side of the ankle for many years now. This original paper by Brostrom, which was modified by Gould, is the classic repair. And in his repair, he talked about imbricating um, the middle of the ATFL and the CFL to make them shorter, which must have a functional and a proprioceptive effect. And he also talked about, or Gould added, um, imbricating in part of the inferior extensor retinaculum, which has a proprioceptive effect. And this is what it looks like when you actually do it. You make a small hole at the front of the fibula, and there is the front of the fibula. And in this patient, they'd actually pulled off the ATFL from the bone, so there was a sort of a bare area. And when you removed it, you could do a nice demonstration of an anterior draw and an inversion um, test. And in this case, we didn't imbricate the middle of the ligament. I actually put some bone anchors into the bone and took the remnants of the ATFL and put them back onto the fibula. And at the end of the procedure, you have a nice solid reconstruction. And you go and fetch part of the inferior retinaculum here, which has the, the, the combined effect of covering up those sutures, which the patients often find quite prominent under the skin, and adding an, act, an, an extra layer of proprioceptive uh, protection. The non-anatomical reconstructions have got a very good long history. So this is a Christman snook. You all heard of that? So Christmas Stuck was described probably 40 years ago, and it was taking one of the perineal tendons, so this is, this, is a, this is the lateral side of the ankle, this is perineus brevis, they've taken away perineus longus. This is the normal perineus brevis coming down here and inserting into the base of the fifth. And in this procedure, you take half of it, you feed it up through the fibula, and then back down through the oscalsis, and then back up to the talus, in the hope that you sort of recreate the iso... Um, metric points of the ATFL and the CFL. But of course you don't. The ATFL goes from there to there, 
So you don't ever quite manage that. And the, and the, CF, and the, the CFL goes from there back to here. So you don't recreate that either. And these patients tend to get, because of abnormal movement, early degenerative change, rather like the non-anatomical um, ACL reconstructions that were done many, many years ago. And so we try to avoid that uh, for those reasons. Also, of course, the perineal tendons are extremely important dynamic stabilizers of the lateral side of the ankle. So taking one is a bad thing to do. You're, you're stealing from uh, Peter to pay Paul. So with these days, we tend to do a more anatomic reconstruction if the brostrum gould fails. So you can see here, someone's taken a bit of hamstring and with some anchors, recreated the ATFL and the CFL. It's reserved for those um, that have failed our um, repair. Um, it's also useful in people that are big. Um, some athletes that do big stuff, shot putters, javelin throwers, that sort of thing, heavy labor occupations. And it's also useful in those patients that have got generalized hypermobility or one of the um, inherited disorders such as Marfan's. There's a move, rather like in the knee with ACL reconstruction, to going over to arthroscopic um, techniques for doing this. But it's extremely difficult and still in the early stages of development. The first, um, the first version of this was an arthroscopic version of just taking the inferior retinaculum and, and dragging it in. There's a fairly high incidence of catching some of the superficial nerves, which the patients obviously don't like. And of course, it doesn't recreate any mechanical instability. It's all relying on a proprioceptive thing. The more, um, more recent descriptions are of actually using a bit of um, hamstring and recreating the tendons arthroscopically. But the holes that you make around the ankle to do the surgery currently aren't much bigger than the combined holes of the, um, the arthroscopic procedure. And so the advantage is yet to be prove, proven. So what about the patients with hyperlaxity? Do we do anything differently with those? Well, they are quite generalized hypermobility is quite common, but we don't see many patients with problems in the ankle. So what do we do? Well, what I personally do is I do the same, actually. I take a very good history to make sure that I'm not missing osteochondral defects, perineal tendons, and so on. And then I do the same thing, but I warn them that there's a higher risk of it failing. There is a move to augmenting our ATFL reconstruction with some form of internal brace, which is a bit of Kevlar or native tissue. Um, and some people would even do a, a secondary reconstruction. The problem with a secondary reconduction and taking hamstring from the patient, of course, is that the hamstring has abnormal collagen in it. So you're much better off using allograft rather than um, homograft. How do we prevent chronic ankle injury? Uh, chronic ankle instability, sorry. Well, to my mind, it's thorough diagnosis and treatment right at that initial time. That, the first time you get hold of a patient is the best time to get to the bottom of what the problem is and treat it properly at the beginning and prevent a problem. We know from that, that nice study of the basketball players that lack of rehab increases the risk. Um, and there's quite good evidence now that bracing and taping do prevent instability. But it brings on the consideration of, is there a role in surgery at a primary injury? And that's a very controversial area. So what are the conclusions? The key to all of this is a good history and examination right at the beginning, because that's your, the best opportunity to pick up occult injuries. Um, you mustn't forget that spectrum of mechanical to functional instability and work out exactly what the patient is complaining of, because that will tell you what the problem is. I always get an MRI scan, and I almost always get an ultrasound scan. Um, and if you want to avoid complications and failure, you need to, you need to treat all the, all the pathology that's there. From the point of view of surgery and reconstruction of the ligaments, anatomical repair is still the gold standard. Um, we always perform an arthroscopy unless we've demonstrated that there's no other pathology to be treated. Anatomical reconstruction is much preferable in revision cases to the old fashioned Christmas Stuck um, Jones procedures. Um, and early reconstruction should be considered in high volume centers in, in elite athletes, potentially, but the evidence is still lacking. And there's a move to arthroscopic repair and reconstruction, but this is still um, in very much in the development stage. Thank you.